we started last week, we started last week a series called Bold. Everybody say Bold. Now, many of y'all did not say that very boldly. I'm just saying. I mean, first service, I get it. They woke up earlier. They had to be here earlier. But second service, come on. Come on. So can someone say bold? There we go. There we go. I love it. We started this series last week about unleashing our faith. We have been talking about two men, Elijah and Elisha. And the power that they have and what God did in both of them and through them. As a duo and as an individual. Today we continue this topic in the book of 2 Kings. So if you have your Bible, I'm going to ask that you turn to the book of 2 Kings. And while you turn to 2 Kings chapter 2, I want to tell you a story that took place in 1936. In 1936, a 17-year-old by the name of Bob Feller became a pitcher for the Cleveland Indians. And he was so good that he played 18 seasons for them, only missing four years because he was joined the Navy to fight in World War II. He was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1965 and is now considered by many to be the greatest right-handed pitcher in baseball history. His fastball was so intimidating that they called him the Bullet Bob. Bullet Bob. And in his career, he struck out 2,581 of the batters who faced him. When Bob was nine years old, his teacher asked him to write an essay about an oak tree. And here's what he wrote. It's very short. An oak tree can cut down and sawed into boards. You can take and you can make baseball bats out of them. You can also make home plates out of the boards and you can make bleachers out of the boards so people can watch a baseball game. Do you think just maybe Bob Feller liked baseball? It's little wonder that he was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame because This man was committed to being one of the greatest baseball players to ever live. And today we hit this topic on another great and phenomenal man that we're learning from. His name being Elisha. And we're going to see what God is going to do in his life and relate it to what God wants to do in our life. So if you have your Bible... Open up to 2 Kings chapter 2. I'm going to ask if you would all stand in reverence as we begin to read 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. It begins and it says, And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please. For the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the son of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the son of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to them, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from you? over you today? So he answered, yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to 
the Jordan. Do you feel like a child wanting to go to the store with you? Dad, can I go to the store? No, honey. Stay here with mom. She'll take care of you. I'll be right back. But dad, dad, dad. You, you ever do that? And they just like, they're repetitive. I feel like it's the same thing. We're being repetitive here. But let's see why. They headed off to Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives... And as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance. While the two of them stood by the Jordan, now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. And it was divided this way and that, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Verse 10, So he said, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened, as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and, and tore them into two pieces. And he also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him. And went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah and had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elisha rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Then they said to him, Look now, there are fifty strong men with your servants. Please let them go and search for your master, lest perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, You shall not send anyone. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, Send them. Therefore, they sent 50 men and they searched for three days but did not find him and when they came back to him for he had stayed in Jericho he said to them did I not say to you do not go let's pray Heavenly Father, we come up before you, Lord God, in this passage as we read. I pray that you will give us the ears to hear, the heart to feel, Lord God, all that you are wanting to say and all that you're wanting to do. Lord God, will you speak to us? Will you pour out into us? And will we just experience you like the first time and forever? Lord God, I pray that you will begin just to prepare our hearts and prepare the way for where you are going to take our conversation this morning. And all that you're going to do, Lord God, we give you the glory, for you deserve it all. In your mighty name we pray, everyone said. Amen. Amen. You may be seated right where you are. So we take on this topic of Elisha and Elijah, a great and great mighty man who was committed to God and was a prophet for God. About three years before, God had selected Elisha to be the great Elijah's replacement. Now, we are not told anything of what happened during that three years or so. All we are told is that now Elijah is leaving. He's about to be taken up in a fiery chariot, and everybody seems to know it. According to the text, 
text, Elijah began his journey in Gilgal and went to Bethel, then to Jericho and finally to the Jordan River to be caught up with God. As the story unfolds, and as Elijah is leaving Gilgal, he turns to Elisha and we hear repeatedly him say, please stay here. But Elisha refuses and says, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. And this happens over and over again. At each community, Elijah turns to Elisha and says to stay here. And Elisha in return says, I'm not leaving you. I'm not going. Finally, Elijah just stops and lets Elijah go all the way to his destination. The very first thing that we begin to see within this scripture is that Elisha was willing to go as far as he needed to go and to be in the presence of God. He was willing to go as far as he needed to be in the presence of God. Are you willing and are you able and are you wanting to go the distance it takes to be in the presence of God? It's a question that every single one of us, by the end of today, should have an answer for. Now, there was something that caught my attention as well. And that was that each of these areas that they visited seemed to have some type of Bible college of sorts for the prophets, called the sons of the prophets. And it, it would appear that Elijah may be paying one last visit to the men he's been training to be prophets. But what's really curious to me is this. None of these prophets wanted to tag along. None of them seemed to be interested in seeing a fiery chariot up close. Now, just by a show of hands, how many of you would say, I would love to see Elijah being swept up by a fiery chariot? Okay, like, that would be me all the way. I would love to see that. I think that would be absolutely amazing. But these prophets, they weren't really interested in doing that. In fact, in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 7, it tells us again, if you have your notes or your Bible open, it says, 50 men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood, here it is, at some distance. At some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. They want to see what's going on, but they don't want to get too close. What's the deal? What's going on here? You call yourself a prophet and yet you're not wanting to go see it? Or, or what's really taking place here? Well, it comes down to this. These, two, these guys, these prophets, they didn't want to go that far. And they didn't want to get that close. And when it comes to following God, that's what happens to many of us. They don't want to go too far or get too close. Why? Because it's hard. But let's, let's make this scriptural. Let's look at scripture. We know the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. But if we keep reading, we'll see that Jesus fed 5,000, but only 500 followed him after lunch. He had 12 disciples, but only three went further into the garden. And only one stood with him at the cross. The closer you get to the cross, the smaller the crowd gets. You see, some people are afraid to get too close. It's like they're afraid that if they get too close, God might want more from them than what they're already willing to give. If I get too close, God might say it's time to be more generous instead of giving 10% and give 12%. If I give more to God, he's going to want my child. He's going to want my home to be used by him. He's going to want my car to be used by him. And I'm only willing to give God so much. Some of us are afraid to take that step to be closer to God. There's a story of 
of, uh, of kids that were practicing their track meet. Uh, they were doing the, I, man, I lost it again. I lost it in first service. Y'all are going to have to help me. The high jump, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the high jump. They were doing the high jump. Y'all know what the high jump is? Where they have the pad and then they have a bar set at a specific height. The kids will run and they have to jump over, lounging their feet up in the air without hitting the bar. Well, these kids were getting ready. They were in competition. And so they're beginning to run. And one by one, these they were sixth graders. They ran, and they were running right towards it. And all of a sudden, they veer off, and they keep running. And there was a gentleman standing in the crowd. And he's like, what, what was that about? That was weird. Was there a bee? Like, what's going on? But then the next sixth grader gets there. And now it's their turn to run and jump. So they run, and they run and run and run. And then they run right past as well. And then the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. And they begin to see this over and over to finally, anybody thankful those stages in any longer so I don't have to run any further? I used to run track, but not anymore. <laughs> I've learned not to. Anyway, um, as they kept running, they kept passing, and this guy was saying, why, why, why are they doing this? And it, he got frustrated to the point he went down to the coach, and he's like, coach! What is going on? Why are they running straight towards it and then running right past it? And here's what the coach said. It happens all the time. But he continues. It happens all the time, he said. Until they get over their fear of failure, many won't even try to jump. Let me say that again. It happens all the time. Until they get over their fear of failure, many won't even try to jump. Man, that, that one phrase could be a whole sermon by itself, but I'm going to stay on track. By contrast, Elisha wasn't afraid. And he was committed to jumping as high as he could for God. He wasn't afraid of the possibility of failure. There's a book that my wife and I have read multiple times. I suggest it to every single one here to read. It's by John C. Maxwell, Failing Forward. We will all fail, but it's the fact we get ourselves up and dust ourselves off and keep on going. You've heard me say that. So maybe it's time for us to do that. Not be afraid of the distance that God is calling us to. But here's my second thing that I begin to see or that God began to reveal to me as we saw Scripture. Elisha had perseverance. He repeatedly told Elijah, I'm going with you. I will not leave you. Wherever you go, I'm going. That's why God repeatedly tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6, we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper I will not be afraid. But do we mean it to the full extent? And that's the most satisfying way to follow God, is not being afraid. There's a prayer that I want you to write down, jot down, or, or say every day. And if you would, just repeat after me. Dear God, your will. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Amen. That's the kind of prayer we need to learn to pray in all of our situations. So Elisha wasn't afraid to follow Elijah because he knew Elijah would lead him into the presence of God. Elisha was willing to go as far as he needed to go to be in God's presence. And part of the reason Elisha did what he did was because he wasn't satisfied with just getting by. Now bear in mind, the other prophets were doing God's work. I'm not putting them to shame. I'm not saying they were in the wrong. That's not what I said, and that's not what I'm saying. But I think the reason they stood far off was because they were content with that. They were satisfied with the way things were. They didn't really want to do anything extra. 
You ever meet someone like that? Maybe like your child? Yeah? You tell them, go clean your room? And what do they do? No. They say no, right? It's like, what? What'd you, what'd you just say? I said, yes. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Right? You get their act together. It's like, okay, go clean your room. And they go clean their room, and then when they're done, they come out, I'm done. You are. Now, if you're anything like my mom, my mom would say, okay, well, I'm going to go get a big old trash bag, and if there's anything left, I'm going to go pick it up. You better check and make sure. Ain't nobody want to touch my toys. And so what, what does mom do? They go and look. They look around. And they say, oh, well, everything, everything's picked up. And then they go and open the closet door. And just like the cartoons, everything piles out. What did the kids do? They did just enough just to get by. Jesus warned us to not be a Christian like that. Luke 17, 10, it says, When you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are un unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. In other words, don't be satisfied with just getting by in your faith. Strive to do more. Strive because God has more. Strive not for your glory or your fame or what Pastor Charity said, a good pat on the back. Do it for God's glory and God's fame and let God do the rest. 1 Corinthians, we could also read what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, where it says, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose itself, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one of us has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now, Paul, I want you to notice what Paul is saying. You can get by in your faith if that's all that you want to do. I mean, you, you can use second-rate material is what he's saying, like wood or hay or straw. And in the day of judgment, you can still get in the door or you'll still be saved. But all the stuff you just got by with will burn up and be worthless because you didn't give God your best. But notice... If you give God your best, you will receive a reward. You will receive a reward, like it said in verse 14. And that's what Elisha was shooting for. He wasn't shooting to just to get by, just to get the, well done, good and faithful servant. I forgot your name, but go ahead and go in now. No, he'll know your name. But he was shooting to have a reward. And that's what Elijah was shooting for. And he wasn't afraid to ask for it. Because the third thing that we begin to see that Elisha did was he asked and wanted a double portion. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9, it says, When they had crossed the Jordan River on dry ground, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken away from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, 
it shall not be so. Now, how many of us, by show of hands, are saying, I want a double portion from God? I tell you what, I want a double portion from God. I am believing in this church to have a double portion from God. If you look at the stats from last year to this year, last year we averaged in attendance all across kids and youth and adults at 60 individuals. And today we're averaging around the 120 to 125. We're seeing the double portion. But the double portion doesn't just come with people filling a building. We've had double baptismals. We've had double salvations. We've seen God move more than ever before. And I'm believing that in the last four months of this year, God is going to go above and beyond. Why? Because he doesn't stop with the double. He wants to make his presence known. So he's going to pour out even more. So as pastor, I'm willing to go all in. I don't want just to get by. I want all that God has. Why? Because I want all that God has for every single one of you. I want what God has for every single one of your kids. Come on, somebody. We've heard it's easy to raise a child in a way. It's harder to fix a human, uh, an adult. So if we can train the kids now, what kind of double or triple portion will they get because of the heritage you're leaving behind? Because you went all in for God. But I really want us to understand what double portion even means within Scripture. Because Scripture does talk about double portion and what it does mean. A double portion of Elijah's spirit is what Elisha was asking for. Now, essentially, Elisha was asking for the right of the firstborn. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 17 tells us that for a father to give the right of the firstborn was for him in the giving of a double portion of all that the father has. Elisha was boldly asking to be treated like a firstborn son of Elijah. He was asking for the same spirit that empowered the ministry of Elijah be given to him as well. Elisha didn't want to be a second-rate follower of God. He wanted to be the best follower of God that he could possibly be. And that meant that he wanted to be just like Elijah. And he did. Elisha did get to be just like Elijah. Just for starters, he was able to copy what Elijah did at the Jordan, parting the river by striking it with the cloak. In 2 Kings chapter 2, we read in verse 13, we're told Elisha took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he struck the water, the water was parted from one side to the other, and Elisha went over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. But the blessing didn't stop at the Jordan. The blessing did not stop at the Jordan. In Scripture, Elijah is recorded doing around 14 miracles. But in contrast, Elijah did 28 miracles. However, Elisha couldn't have done it all in, on his own. And I'm not saying it was all Elisha, bravo to Elijah. It was the God that he served that did those miracles through. Double portion. A double portion. He wouldn't have gotten that blessing if he hadn't desired it with all of his heart. 
This is the kind of mindset Jesus talked about when he said in Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. I, I want you to notice something in this scripture. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It doesn't say that you always have to hunger and thirst, but it doesn't, all, it doesn't also say that you'll always be filled. Why? Because it's a cycle. You have to hunger and thirst and bless and pour out. Hunger and thirst and begin to pour out. Hunger and thirst and begin to pour out. Some of the blessings that God has given you is not for you just to take hold and take captive. No, some of those blessings God has given you is to bless someone else or to bless another individual. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. That means that you have decided to want God so involved in your life that you'll do whatever you have to to attain that. And the fourth bonus point here is the last thought I have is that Elisha realized that the only way that he would get the double portion was if God gave it to him. You can try to get the double portion by yourself, but do you want your own double portion, human double portion, or do you want God's double portion? I wanna close with this story. There's a story of two boys they were in their Sunday class learning about Elijah and the ascent from the chariot of fire. One boy asked his friend that was sitting by him, wouldn't you be afraid to ride in such a chariot? His friend looked at him and was like, well, it all depends on who's driving the chariot. I think that's a vital point. If God is driving the chariot, it's gonna be okay. You will be safe. You'll be taken care of. Anywhere he leads me, anywhere he leads you, I can safely go. There's a song, old hymnal. You might know it, I'm not gonna sing it, but I do wanna read you the words. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. And I'll do anything because he is there. The song says, it may be in the valley where countless dangers hide. It may be in the sunshine that I in peace abide. But this one thing I know, if it be dark or fair, if Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Tis heaven to me, where I may be, if he is there. I count it a privilege here, his cross to bear. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Is Jesus with you where you're at? Can we all stand? In the footnote of, of my sermon, I have listed all 14 miracles that took place with Elijah and all 28 miracles that took place with Elisha with the reference of finding it in scripture as well. If you want that, let me know. I'll send that over to you. I thought about going over it all, but I think that's gonna be a couple weeks. And so I said, you know what? But it's pretty neat to see what Elijah done and what Elisha did and how God didn't just do what Elisha did but he showed up and showed off through Elisha so I wonder if there's anyone here today that's saying I I'm like the others where I, I, I like to see it from the distance I just don't want to get too close I, I'm afraid to go and do a high jump because I'm afraid of how high God is going to want me to jump. I, I'm, I'm 
I'm afraid to step out with my friends and letting them know of who my God is. I'm afraid of speaking truth in the workplace. I'm scared to let my parents know who God is. I'm worried about A, B, C, and D. And we go down this afraid track. When in reality, if you just give your all, wouldn't it be amazing? Bring the kids in here and ask them, hey, Matthew, hey, Martin, what do you see in your dad? I want what he's got and more because Jesus is written all over him. What if we change that mindset? where our firstborns and our children actually wanted us in their life because they saw how powerful the God is in our life, how faithful we are. Strong warriors for Christ, all generations, just saying, I want more of you, God, and I wanna get as close as I can. Tell me how high to jump and I'm going to jump. Tell me how far I'm going to go and I'll go. Tell me where to go and I'll do it. Even if it is like we talked about last week, Elijah having to walk 300 miles. Lord, you tell me the distance and I'll go. You tell me what to do and I'll go. Why? Because all we want is more of him for his glory to be shown. With every head bowed and eyes closed. I wanna pray for two groups this morning. The first group being those who don't have Jesus in their life and they're they're saying, I I wanna give my life to God. I wanna live for Him. I wanna be with Him. And I wanna go as far as He'll take me. And then the second group I believe that's here is the ones that are saying, I've given my life to God and it's time that I ask God for a double portion to not just get by or or to see what's taking place in the distance, but to get involved in his handiwork, to get involved in what he's doing and to see all that he's going to do. To say, yes, Lord, to jump as high as he wants me to jump, to go as far as he wants me to go. If you're in that first group saying, I wanna give my life to God, would you just slip up your hand so I can pray with you? Seize your hand. In just a moment, we're going to pray. But if you're the other individual saying, I've given my life to God, but I've, I've just been serving Him just to get by. I don't want to get by. I don't want to go day in and day out. I want to go all in. I want a double portion. If that's you, will you slip up your hand? everywhere are going up. Can we all just raise our hands? Heavenly Father, we just call upon your life right now, Lord Jesus. We call upon our Abba Father. We call upon you, Lord God, to show us the way, to show us the direction that no matter what, even if a fire strikes our backyard, that we'll have joy that comes in the morning. That we will continue to stay faithful and we'll be able to tell our neighbors about how good you are, how good your grace is. If you raise your hand and you're in that first group, I want you just to boldly profess between you and God that you want your life to be ran by Him now. That you are admitting that He is Lord and Savior. That you are believing that He came to die on the cross and three days later rose again. And now today you're saying, I am committing my life over to Him. I might not be perfect, but I will give Him my all. You just begin to pray that right now. Heavenly Father, I pray over the individual. Lord God, I pray that you will give them strength in the days ahead. I pray that you'll begin to speak and to move in individuals. 
Lord God, the ones that are saying that they're giving their life to you for the very first time, will you begin to open their eyes to see things like they've never seen it before? Will they begin to see how good and how faithful you are and how great your mercy and grace is? And Lord God, I pray over every individual that had their hand raised saying, I don't want to get by. I want to be all in. I want to jump as high. I want to be as close as I can get. I want that double portion like Elisha wanted from Elijah. Lord God, I pray over every individual in this room that they will see that double portion. That you will pour out upon their life, Lord God. That you will begin to speak to them, Lord Jesus. Your will, Lord. Nothing more. Nothing less. Nothing else. Just what you have for us. Let us jump. Let us get close. And let us watch all that you're going to do. Not for the pat on the back. To but tell others about your praise and about your glory and about how good you are because you are a good God you are a faithful God and I say thank you, thank you, thank you thank you Lord thank you Lord for always being faithful thank you Lord for always extending your grace and your mercy Lord, for just who you are and all that you are doing. In your mighty name we pray. Everybody said, if you receive it, can you just give him a shout of praise? Amen. Thank you.